Good morning. We are Eau Claire Baptist Church. We welcome you this morning as we worship our Savior. I just wanted to give you a couple of announcements. One of them is our pastor is not here today. Uh, he and his family went for a short vacation, and uh, but they will be returning soon. In his stead, we have Rev, uh, Reverend, is it Reverend or James? We have James uh, White here. And James, I see his wife, Stephanie, also came. We're so glad you came to support your husband. A lot of times the wife doesn't come, you know, but we do appreciate it. Uh, there are some other announcements located in your bulletin, and the main thing is Wednesday evening coming up. Uh, the Wednesday evening activities will resume, so you want to be here, and that supper starts at 5 o'clock. I never miss that one. I wanted to tell you a couple of things about the first song that we're going to sing, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. Philip Bliss was born in a log cabin in Pennsylvania a long time ago. The only entertainment they had in that house was when they all got to sing a few hymns that they knew. Well, when he was 10 years old, he sold vegetables from door to door. And on one particular day, there was a noise coming out of a house. Uh, actually, it was music that he had never heard anything like this. He climbed over the fence and he sneaked into the house. There was a lady playing a piano. He had never seen or heard a piano before. He stood there just enthralled. When she finished, he said, oh lady, please don't stop. Please play some more. Well, she was terribly frightened and she began saying some not so nice things to him as he ran out of the house. But he knew from that day on that music would be the great part of his life. In 1876, he was married to, to Lucy. They were on a train going to Chicago to be in a revival service. Unfortunately, the bridge that the train went over collapsed and they fell 75 feet to the ground. Immediately, the flames started. So there's the fire going. Philip was able to get out of the car, but couldn't find his wife. They said, oh, she's still in there. Well, she was trapped. They said, you can't go in. He said, I'm going in. He did go in, uh, but they both happened to die in that fire. A few weeks later, the trunk, their trunk, their traveling trunk, arrived in Chicago. And that's when they opened it and found the words to the song he had just written, I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. So that's how we got that song. So I'd like for us to stand now as we sing this song, I will sing of my Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer with his blood. He purchased me on the cross. He sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story how my lost estate to save. In his boundless love and mercy, he the ransom freely gave. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood, he purchased me on the cross. He sealed my pardon, 
paid the debt and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly pardon. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, O oh, sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me Thank you. Let's be seated. And it's time now for the children's message with Mr. Richard. Also, I wanted to mention Barbara is here this morning, Barbara Miller. Her official title, I understand, is chaplain at the VA hospital in Clarksburg, West Virginia. She's recently gone through some eye surgery, and she said it is great now. If you want to talk to her, you better do it soon because she's headed back to West Virginia tomorrow, and she'll be giving us the benediction today. Well, good morning. How are you guys? Y'all doing okay today? You couldn't get your brother to come down here with you? He just won't do it, will he? And I need all the people I can get. Okay. All righty. Well, I, he's going to be sorry because I've got something for you here. Yeah. He loves M&Ms, huh? All right. Well, I'm going to give each of you a few of these. Here you go. Have a seat there, sir. He came just for the M&Ms. Well, that's okay. That is okay. That's part of the reason that we've got him up here today. All right, I'm going to ask you about these M&Ms. Tell me, um, do they all look alike? No. No? Why not? They're different colors. What colors do you have? What do you have? Yellow, two browns, and an orange. What colors have you got? Two... Oranges, two yellows, and one red and one brown. Wow. Got any different colors than that? Brown and orange. How about you, Malachi? Oh, Malachi's got a different color. What you got? Green. Green. Okay, they're all different colors, so they do not look alike. How about eat one of them? Now I want you to pick up another one that's a different color and eat that one. Can you tell a difference in how they taste? No, you can't? You mean the orange ones and the green ones, that they all taste the same? Wow. Well, you know what? When the people decided to make M&Ms, they knew that everybody liked what? What's in the middle of that? Chocolate. They knew everybody liked chocolate. So they made all these M&Ms the same. They made all those M&Ms chocolate. And then they looked at them and they said, well, you know, that's you know kind of boring, so let's go ahead and let them have different colors. So they put different colors on them, but on the inside, they are all the same, right? Every one of those that you've got is the same. It's all chocolate. I want you to think about that because God feels that way about people. He made all the people. He made every person. He started with Adam and Eve, and then every person since then, and every one of them he made the same on the inside because he made them in his image. Okay? So just like those M&Ms are all chocolate on the inside, people are all God's image on the inside. Doesn't matter what they look like. Doesn't matter where they come from. Doesn't matter what clothes they wear, how smart they are. They're all God's image on the inside. What day is coming up on Monday? Who knows what day? We've got a holiday from school. Martin Luther King. All right, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Well, I want you to know that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and he was called Reverend because he was a pastor, so he had studied a lot about God and the Bible, and he knew a lot about what God believed and what, how God wanted us to believe. 
And he was a doctor because he studied real hard on a particular subject for a long time. He went to school for a long time to get that doctorate. And that's not a doctor like a medical doctor, but it is a doctorate. So he, he knew a lot about God and he knew a lot about a lot of things. He was a smart, well-educated, godly person. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. knew that God made us all in his image on the inside. And he spent a lot of time trying to teach other people about that. Now, because we're all made in God's image on the inside, God loves each and every one of us the same. He loves every one of us. And what does he want us to do? What does he want us to do? If he loves us, what does he want us to do? To love each other, right? And to love all the people because we know that whoever we meet, wherever they're from, whatever they believe, whatever they look like, on the inside they're made in God's image and God wants us to love each other. And that was one of the things that Dr. King wanted to teach everybody. And it's one of the things that I hope you'll remember today. Okay, let's have a word of prayer and then I've got something to give you. Dear Father, we thank you that you made each and every one of us in your image. And we ask that you help us to love everyone that we meet just as you love us. Help us to carry forth your word and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Richard and boys and girls. Our next hymn this morning is more about Jesus. So I'd like for us to stand in as we sing. At the end of this song, James will be coming up to bring us the message today. We look forward to that, James. Okay. More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus let me learn more of his holy will discern spirit of god my teacher be showing the things of christ to me more more about jesus more more about jesus more of his saving fullness see his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his saving night for me. Thank you. Let's be seated. We'll be having the offertory in just a moment. Good morning, church. Our scripture reading is found in Acts chapter 10. I'll be reading beginning in verse 34. <clears throat> then Peter thus, then Peter opened his mouth and said in truth, I perceive that God has, shows no respect of person. As we come here today, as I read that scripture and I speak from Acts chapter 10, we should be reminded of that. What a wonderful demonstration of God's plan for man 
and a children's message. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to give a portion of what God has given to us, we should be reminded that all is his. He owns all. He loves all. He's in control of all. Let's spend some time in prayer. Our Father, our God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the love that you show to us each and every day. We thank you that you came and you died so that we could be reconciled to a holy God. We thank you that you woke us up this morning. We thank you for your provision and your love. We pray, Lord, that as we worship you this day, we be reminded that all is yours. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to return a portion of what you've given to us, we pray that it will be used for your glory and for the edification of the body. We love you, and we thank you for loving us. And we pray these things in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you for the time of giving. Thank you for returning to God a portion of what he's given to us. <clears throat> I want to thank Pastor Stephen for providing the opportunity for me to come and, and speak to you again. As stated, I'll be speaking from Acts chapter 10. As you saw that in the bulletin, it's a long chapter. I'm not going to read every verse. Uh, but I'm going to read what I believe to be uh, all of Scripture is important. But when you have an opportunity to share the gospel of Christ, that is something that we should do uh, at every opportunity that's set before us. So as we read the Scripture, I'll read. And Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but to every nation, whosoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus, teaching priests by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was 
proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism, which John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, and with power and sent about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. And God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both <clears throat> both to the uh, land of the man, I can't see Jews and to Jerusalem. My goodness. When they killed um, by hanging on a tree, him God raised up um, and on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God. And I apologize, I have difficulty seeing at this time. But the devil's busy, but he's not going to win because God has a message for you. As I pray, our Father and our God, we thank you. We thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for the hope that is found in you. We thank you that you chose us in eternity's past to be members of your household. I pray, Lord, that as I communicate this truth to your people, that you will move me out of the way. The Spirit of God will come forth and that you will deliver the truth to your people. I pray that someone will hear and come to the saving knowledge of Christ. I pray that those in attendance will be edified. We love you for who you are, and we thank you for the blessed hope that we have in you. I pray these things in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. All right. <clears throat> As I speak today, I speak with the theme, one hope, one faith, one God of all. As I stated, the scripture reference is found in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 serves as a means for God to communicate to his people that the word of God is going to go forth. Not only is it going to go forth, it's going to go forth to all nations. And as we come today to celebrate uh, the MLK holiday, I want to thank uh, the good doctor for that m and &M demonstration because it showed God's plan for people. It showed that although we look different on the outside, we are the same on the inside, with one exception. One exception. We are the same on the inside. The question becomes, do we have inside of us that person that makes a difference? And that person is the Holy Spirit. So as we communicate God's truth, we come to an understanding that our purpose in life is for all people to come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Tomorrow's King Day. It's an important day in our nation's history. As the good doctor said, King came with a purpose. One, to communicate to people that we're all the same and that we're, our differences do not matter. Satan created in our hearts and minds a feeling that because we look different, we think different, we act different, that we have to be different. You can disagree and not be disagreeable. So as I think of the theme today, that comes to mind. Dr. King had a dream. And the question becomes, what is a dream? As a retired educator, I looked to the dictionary, because everything comes from the dictionary. And I wanted to say, I wanted to learn, when you think of dream, what does it mean? And Webster's dream, when defined as a verb, reads, to have a series of thoughts, images, or emotions while sleeping, to have a dream, to indulge in daydreams or fantasies, to appear tranquil, or dreaming. 
And as I prayed and asked God to give me a message along that theme, Acts chapter 10 came to mind. But why did it come to mind? Well, number one, I know that it showed as a prelude to the gospel going to the world. But it begins, and the focus is on a situation where two individuals had a dream. They had a vision. They had a belief. And in that belief, the Holy Spirit responded to bring them together so that all people could be blessed, so that we can become unified in the hope that we have in Christ. Because we have one hope. We have one faith. We have one God for all. And God used a dream to communicate that message to his messenger, to a Gentile who wanted to know truth. And in seeking that truth, God provided a way for the word of God to be spread. As I talk to you today, I'm going to look at a couple of areas. I'm going to look at a couple of people. I'm going to talk about Cornelius. I'm going to talk about Peter. I'm going to talk about the spirit. And I'm going to talk about the impact of others. First, let's look at Cornelius. A dream. A divine encounter, a spiritual revelation, a supernatural experience. In chapter 2, what do we learn about Cornelius? Excuse me, verse 2, what do we learn? He's a man of conviction. He's a man in search of the truth. What is the truth? It tells us in his word that he was a man that feared God and he wanted to do godly things and he treated people with respect. But how many of you know doing right things did not bring you to the saving knowledge of Christ? Peter needed an encounter. Excuse me, Cornelius needed an encounter. How did God respond? Look at verse 3 in Acts chapter 10. And let me pull this up. And the scripture reads About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Peter, a devout, Cornelius, a devout man, Seeking God, and what does God do? He sends an angel in a vision to give him a direction. What is that direction? To go. What do we see that? In verses 7 and 8. He tells him, you have got to go. And you send people to Peter. And how does he respond? He gets too confident. And he takes those individuals and he gives them a direction to go seek out Peter. How many of you know when you're seeking God, he'll find a way? The last time I was here, I spoke in behalf of the Gideon ministry. The purpose of the Gideon ministry is to get the word of God out all over the world. We do that when individuals make the decision to give to support the ministry. In this situation, Cornelius is seeking God and the Holy Spirit provides the way for him to obtain truth. There are people all over the world seeking truth. We've got to get the word of God out. 
Cornelius acted. When given a vision, he responded accordingly, and he sent messengers to seek out Peter so that he could find truth, he could find hope, he could have what we have. A dream initiated that in Cornelius. The amazing thing is this. The scripture tells us that he had a devout heart and he wanted to know God. There are people everywhere who want to know God. People in your family, people in your community, people at your workplace. Get the message out. Share the hope that you have. You have one hope, one faith, one God for all. Peter's response in regard to the situation. In verses 9 to 23, you see the revelation that comes to Peter. Peter's at, at Simon's house, relaxing, probably praying, wondering how he's going to get the word of God out. And God responds to him. As I stated, in 9 through 23, you see the dream and the encounter that happened when Peter um, was out meditating. He went to a roof to pray. While he's there, he's hungry. How many of you know when you're hungry, your mind wanders? <laughs> when you're hungry, you, you, know, you don't know what to do. The only thing you think about is it's time to eat. He goes to a roof and he's wondering, what's Simon doing? Is he gonna, he's gonna cook? Are they gonna feed me? But he knows that he needs to be t spend time in prayer and meditation. And while he's there, what happens? The spirit reveals to him as he sees things coming down that he normally would not eat. Now, my, my wife will tell you, I eat a lot of those things, bacon and pork chops and pizza, things I should not eat. And I probably would have responded the same way Peter did um, in the verse, no, Lord, <laughs> I can't eat those things. I've never eaten those things. As a Jew, it was forbidden for him to do certain things. And you see that in 9 through 23. In 9 and 10, it tells us he's praying because he's hungry. He's famished. He needs something to eat. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, after receiving the vision from God, the vision, what does he do? He doubts. There's a refusal there in verse 14. No, Lord, I never eat those things. In life, as we celebrate MLK Day, how many of us have said, no, Lord, I'm not going to interact with those people. They don't look like me. They don't think like me. They don't act like me. God is using food here as a revelation to Peter to let him know that it's not about food. It's about relationship, and he got it. How do we know he got it? <laughs> Look at verse 17. In verse 17, he doubts what he's seeing. He doubts it. But in verse 19, understanding that something miraculous must be going on here, what does he do? He begins to meditate. In verse 19, he's meditating about what he's seeing because he lacks understanding of what God is saying. How many of us know that sometimes we got to meditate? Sometimes we got to get alone. Sometimes we have to find a quiet place where we could sit down and talk to God and say, God, what are you saying to me? God, what are you revealing to me? God, what are you trying to show me? You gotta spend time in prayer. You gotta know that God is speaking to you. And then in verse 21, what does Peter do? He obeys because the Spirit speaks again to him and tells him that he needs to go. Why does he need to go? Because the Spirit is sending people to him so that he could continue in the ministry that God had called him to do. 
How many of you remember Peter when he denied Jesus three times? He denied him, knowing him three times. What did God do to Peter? He restored him. He brought him back and affirmed him three times. As we think about what we're celebrating tomorrow, we need to be affirmed. I need to be affirmed. Because I remember issues that I've had in the past with people who didn't look like me, who didn't act like me. I remember when I thought that, that I was inferior. But God had a different plan. I never thought been born to a mother in the eighth grade. Three siblings before she was 20. Never thought that, that God would bless me to be a college graduate. I have a doctorate. Never thought that. But God had a plan and I had to obey. Just like Peter had to obey, just like you have to obey. And then we have to go out into the world and share that with others to let them know that the same God who loves me loves you, regardless of what you look like, regardless of who you think you are, he loves you anyway. So we see the response of Cornelius. We see the response of Peter. And like me, and like them, we have to know that our response will impact others. How did the others respond? In verse 7 and 8, in verses 17 through 19, and in verse 22, you see those who Cornelius loved and respected respond to truth. You see the ambassadors go. You see them because of the respect and love they had for Cornelius. Go as he commanded them to seek Peter. But you also see the impact of Cornelius on his family. How do you see that? He was a devout man. And even though he did not know Christ, what did he do? He shared with family and friends prior to getting a vision that there was a God and there was truth. And when receiving the vision, he tells them of the vision so that when they go to find Peter and get the message, he can share it with them and they can hear truth. See, if Dr. King had kept the vision to himself, he wouldn't have had the marches. If Dr. King had kept the vision to himself, people of all nationalities, all ethnicities, all backgrounds could not have come together. The peanut M&Ms <laughs> wouldn't unify to make something that we all can enjoy. That's what Cornelius did. He knew that truth was coming, and he wanted to share that truth with others. And they listened. Why? Because they respected Cornelius. Your circle of friends respect you. Do your family respect you? When you tell them truth, do they believe you? <laughs> they, if they do, they believe you because who you are. And because who Christ is in you, 
because they see a difference in you. If they don't, that's another conversation. But people respected Cornelius. So when he acted and he chose to share what he believed with others, they responded. In verse 23, after the vision that Peter had, he told other Jews what the Spirit had told him and where he was going. They went with him to see if what he was saying was true. So Peter knew, I can't do it alone. How many of you know you can't take it alone? You can't deliver the message of truth alone. You need people with you to serve with you, to pray with you, to go with you, to share the hope that you have. Peter took people with him. In verses 2, 24 through 27, and 33, we're back to Cornelius and his friends. His family, they have to respond as well. They have to know that there's truth, and they have to want that truth. They know you. And because they know you, and you know him, share him with them in anticipation that they also will want to know him. And that God is using you as an opportunity to share him with them. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, it tells us, 28, 19 and 20, it clearly tells us that we're to go and make disciples. Are you discipling anyone? We celebrate MLK Day. He discipled people. He mentored people. He shared with people. So when he met tragedy, the dream still lived. The hope, the faith that we have in Christ, that he's the God of all, will live when we make the decision to share that hope with others and know that God is truth. None of that happens if it were not for the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to move. In Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit is moving throughout that chapter. The great thing is it moves throughout the Bible. Where is it moving? It moves in the life of Cornelius. It moves in the life of Peter. It moves in verses 34 through 43. Read those verses. I had difficulty reading here. Read those verses. The gospel goes out. Peter clearly communicates biblical truth. And when he communicates that truth, what happens? Those who are listening, those who came because of Cornelius, her truth with Cornelius, and when they heard it, and the gospel goes forth, in verses 44 through 48, what happens? The spirit moves. And all that were with Cornelius, his family, his friend, her truth. And when they heard that truth, they responded. How did they respond? They began speaking in tongues and worshiping God. Because they heard truth. Because they heard the gospel. Because now that God, that Cornelius feared that God has a name. And the name is Jesus the Christ. And they could worship because they'd heard 
And now they understood what it was that they heard. And what did they do? They responded. Do you remember when you responded? Do you remember when God became real to you and you began to understand what it was and what it meant to be a follower of Christ? The crazy thing is we fall short every day. I do. Mr. Mark, that we serve a God who loves us anyway, a God who says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So we turn to him when we make mistakes. But that teaches us something else. When he extends grace to us when we make mistakes, we have to extend grace to others when they make mistakes. don't do that all the time. We live in a polarized society. But we've got to extend grace to one another the same way it was extended to us. The other thing I like about 44 through 48 is simply this. You notice what happened? First you had the spiritual baptism when they heard truth, the conversion in the heart and the mind and the soul when they said this is truth. And then Peter and those with him who witnessed it said, you know what? The same God that we serve, they now know. We can see it because the spirit is moving. Water baptism as a public profession of the faith and the hope that you have. Have you been baptized? Have you had that spiritual conversion? Have you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior because of who he is? And when you do that and you begin to understand truth, you can be who he has caused you to be. Look at verse 48 again. Look at it one more time. What happens when they all come to the saving knowledge of Christ, when they realize without doubt that they have one hope because they have one faith and there's one God of all, they fellowship together. He stayed with them to be with them, to grow them, to let them know this road isn't easy. It's difficult, but we're going to be in it together because God is with us and he loves us and he wants us to be the light to the world. Are you the light to the world? Can they see you in him? Are you making a difference for him? You see, dreamers dream. The amazing thing is, not only do they dream, dreamers who know him, like the title of this chapter, the name of this book, they act. Are you acting? And so how are you acting? How are you serving? First, within the local assembly. Are you serving in your family? Are you serving in your community? Are you serving at your workplace? Are you making a difference? And then are you making a difference for him? Because we have one hope. We have one faith. We have one God for all. And Dr. King understood that. And he shared that. Was he perfect? No. But who is perfect? 
outside of Jesus the Christ. We make mistakes, but we can also make a decision to be who he's called us to be by acknowledging our mistakes, extending grace to all that we encounter, and being the church that he's called us to be. Why? We have one hope. We have one faith. We have one God of all. I pray that each and every one of you have made a decision to accept him as Lord and Savior. And as we celebrate MLK Day tomorrow, we'll remember it's a day off for some of us. But it's also a day to remember the challenges that we faced at conception in the end do not matter because we're all the same on the inside with one exception. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And if we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are all the same regardless of ethnicity, financial situation, denominational differences, academic differences, hairstyles, wardrobe, doesn't matter. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And are you sharing the hope that you have in him with others? Now there may be some here this morning, some who are viewing online, who are wondering, how do I do that? Simple. Romans 3.23 tells us you should confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Why should you do that? Because of Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. And I want to escape that death that I deserve. 5.8 tells us that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then <laughs> in John 3.16, it tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. He back to Romans in chapter 10. It tells us if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you're saved. And you become a part of God's family because you've undergone the spiritual baptism. But then make that public profession through the water baptism. So as we come together today, my question to you, do you recognize that we have one faith, we have one hope, one faith, one God of all? And if so, and you have not accepted him as Lord and Savior, you can do so at this time. Spend some time in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for you. We thank you for the hope that we have in you. We thank you for the word, the spirit that moves. Lord, I, I know who you are. I pray that each and every person on the sound of my voice have accepted you as Lord and Savior. We celebrate King Day tomorrow. I pray that we be reminded that regardless of what we look like on the outside, all that matters is that which is on the inside. Because you made us 
the same with one exception, whether or not you've made a decision to accept you as Lord and Savior. Your desire is for no one to perish, but for all to come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And I pray that all will do so. But I also pray, like Cornelius and like Peter, not only will we accept you as Lord and Savior, but we will act to communicate your truth in our homes, our communities, in our workplaces, that we will be the light in this dark world. And I also pray that we will act accordingly and serve as you've commanded us to do so. We love you and we thank you. And I pray that in all things you be glorified and the body edified. And I pray this in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. This time we'll have our benediction. Is that correct? I'm sorry.